The following story takes place between the years 1399 and 1485. In today's episode, we're going to learn about how the conflict between two English dynasties, the House of Lancaster and the House of York, divided the kingdom and led to the War of the Roses. As an interesting point, George R.R. R. Martin took inspiration from this war to write Game of Thrones. Just swap Lancaster for Lannister and York for Stark and you can already see the similarities. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's start at the beginning. In the previous episode, we saw how, after being exiled, Henry Bolingbroke managed to regroup, invade England and force his cousin, King Richard II, to abdicate. Afterwards, Parliament crowned him as Henry IV of Lancaster, giving rise to the Lancaster dynasty, a cadet branch of the Plantagenet family. Because he was considered as an illegitimate ruler by many noblemen, Henry had to put up with constant rebellions. Among his main opponents were two brothers, the Earl of Northumberland, Henry Percy, and his brother, the Earl of Worcester, Thomas Percy. And also there was Henry Hotspur, son of the former. They all belonged to the Percy family, who started out as close allies of the king, until everything changed after the Battle of Holmenden Hill. At this encounter, the Percys defended England from Scotland, but at one point they asked for support, and the king left them high and dry. Don't hold a personal grudge just because you lost. To make matters worse, a rebel leader named Owen Glendower had arisen in Wales. He is famous for adopting the Red Dragon flag for Wales. The guy was proclaimed Prince of Wales by his followers and began a guerrilla war all over the Welsh territory. Initially, he was quite successful, but later his luck turned and the last anyone saw of him was when he fled and hid in the forests. Eventually, Henry IV managed to quell the Percy Rebellion. Henry Hotspur died in battle and Thomas Percy was executed. Henry Percy surrendered and was pardoned, but in 1405 he rebelled once more, this time with the support of the Archbishop of York, Richard Scrope. In fact, most of the North rose against the King, but Henry IV managed to put everyone in their place and then got rid of the Archbishop. Surprisingly, Henry Percy surrendered and was pardoned once again, and unsurprisingly, he rebelled once again. Well, it's Groundhog Day. On this occasion, he obtained support from the Kingdom of Scotland, whom he had recently fought against. Go figure. This rebellion ended in 1408 with the Battle of Branham Moor, where Henry Percy was killed. All of these uprisings, together with the adverse economic times, weighed heavily on King Henry IV, and his health declined until, in 1413, he keeled over and died during a Parliament session. He was then succeeded by his son, Henry V, whose reign was relatively short, just about 10 years. Nevertheless, he is well regarded due to his excellent relationship with the nobility in Parliament his good handling of public money, and for being a firm but not tyrannical king. And well endowed. The first significant conflict of his rule was with the Lollards, who began to conspire against him, led by John Oldcastle. This man was supposedly a close friend of Henry, so when the king found out about his involvement in the plot, he was furious and had him captured and executed. The story goes that he was spit-roasted like a pig, but maybe that's just a myth. Certainly not a pretty image. Without a doubt, the main concern throughout Henry V's life was the ongoing conflict with France, the Hundred Years' War. The situation was at a standstill when he rose to power, since there had been a truce between England and France, which had lasted for several years. In addition, there was also some uncertainty surrounding the French crown around that time, as it was held by Charles VI, who suffered from mental issues and psychotic episodes. Oh, he's slow. This led to a big kerfuffle over the regency, until eventually Jean le Semper, or John the Fearless, Duke of Burgundy, managed to take power. In light of this mess, Henry V decided to make a move, and in 1415 he disembarked at Harfleur in Normandy with a massive army. From there, he marched on to Calais, and a few days later faced the French forces at the Battle of Agincourt, one of the bloodiest in the entire war. 
being on their home soil, the French were vastly superior in numbers. However, heavy rains had turned the battlefield into a bog which became a deadly trap for the excellent French cavalry and enabled the English longbows to make short work of them. As an interesting side note, the story goes that this battle gave rise to a particular English finger gesture and it's directly related to the longbow. Apparently, when the French captured an English soldier, they cut off his index and middle fingers so that he wouldn't be able to use the bow anymore. And so before the battle, the English soldiers used to taunt the enemy by showing them their two fingers as if to say, Here are our fingers, come and get them you bastards. Now back to the story. After his overwhelming victory at Agincourt, Henry had all the prisoners executed. Well, except the nobles, of course, since he could get some hefty ransoms for them. Then his next objective was the Norman city of Caen, which surrendered after a couple of weeks of being sieged and pummeled by the English artillery. After that came Rouen in 1419, and with it Henry V took control of all Normandy. By this point, the French were in total panic mode and fighting amongst themselves. So in 1420, Philip the Good, son and successor of John the Fearless, arranged the Treaty of Troyes, whereby Henry V was recognised as regent and heir to the French throne, as long as both kingdoms were not annexed and each maintained its own institutions, customs and laws. No further contact! The deal was then sealed by Henry's marriage to the French princess Catherine of Valois. Of course, the treaty also meant that the current French king's son, Charles the Dauphin, meaning Dolphin, which was the title of the French heir for some reason, would be disinherited. As you can imagine, the Dolphin didn't take this well. He threw a strop and fled to Bourges, where he set up a parallel rebel court. In spite of this, everything appeared to be going really well for Henry V. He married Catherine and the following year had their first child, also called Henry, who was set to inherit the crowns of both England and France, thus completing the old ambition of his great-great-great-grandfather, Edward Longshanks, of rebuilding the old Angevin Empire. However, as often happens, just when it seemed things were perfectly lined up, the gods of chance got bored and decided to throw in a few wild cards. For starters, in 1422, Henry V fell ill and died at the young age of 35. If he had lasted just a couple of months longer, he would have survived the mad French king, Charles VI, and taken his crown. As it was, his son became King Henry VI of England, but since he was barely a year old, the power was wielded by a regency council, led mainly by his uncle John, Duke of Bedford, along with Henry Beaufort, half-brother of Henry IV, and son of the king's grandfather, John of Gaunt, who at the time was Lord Chancellor and Bishop of Winchester. Another important regent was Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, another of Henry's uncles. Got all that? Good. Now does everyone understand or do I have to repeat myself? Over in France, the Armagnac faction, supporters of Charles the Dauphin, took advantage of this transition in power to proclaim him as King Charles VII, which was kind of troublesome as this meant France now had two different kings since the Treaty of Troyes said that Henry VI of England was the rightful heir. Over the following years, the English forces occupied Paris and most of the north, and by 1429, the Duke of Bedford had managed to reach and lay siege to the key rebel city of Orléans. At this point, everything seemed to indicate that the conflict was going to be resolved and Henry would be triumphant. But just at that moment, another historical wildcard came into play, this time in the form of a brave young girl who rose up out of nowhere to change the course of history. We are of course talking about Joan of Arc, a French peasant who turned up at the court of Chinon to tell Charles the Dauphin that she had heard a voice, supposedly from God, ordering her to stop the invaders at Orléans. And she also said that you should like this video, subscribe to this channel and leave a comment. Weird. Charles replied, This is fantastic, mon chéri. Here, take this armor and a handful of soldiers and go and kill all the English. It's unclear whether Charles really placed any hopes on her, but shockingly, young Joan managed to not only stop the Siege of Orléans, but force the Duke of Bedford to retreat. Later, Joan accompanied the Dauphin to Reims, where he was crowned as King Charles VII of France in 1429. Unfortunately, the following year, Joan was captured by the other French faction, the Burgundians, who handed her over to their English allies. They made an example of her, burning her alive at a public square in Rouen, and later held a coronation for young Henry VI as King of France at the Parisian Cathedral of Notre Dame. 
Joan of Arc's death reinvigorated the Armagnac faction and they began to beat back the English. Seeing the writing on the wall, the Burgundians decided to switch sides and join the Armagnac. They signed the Treaty of Arras in 1435 and then marched hand in hand to retake Paris, which they achieved in 1436. Paris as uh, France? Henry VI, who at that point was still a young lad, was quite overwhelmed by these events and began to lose more and more territories. Unfortunately for England, he had quite a weak character and was definitely not cut out to be a great leader. Instead, right around this time, his uncles, the regents, began to squabble among themselves until the Duke of Suffolk, William de la Pole, prevailed and got himself appointed Chamberlain and Admiral of England. He then organised a peace treaty with France and sealed it with Henry's marriage to the French king's niece, Margaret of Anjou, in 1444, who would eventually give him a son, Edward of Westminster. But after that, William de la Pole didn't last much longer in court because he had kept hidden an essential part of the deal, which was giving up Maine and Anjou, among other things. He was heavily criticised and sought to flee into exile, but instead he was captured and decapitated. To make matters worse, a soldier of Irish descent called Jack Cade started a rebellion against Henry in Kent. The rebels marched towards London, destroying everything as they went. But happily, Queen Margaret intervened to take control of the situation. She promised a royal pardon to any rebels who backed off and disbanded peacefully, and many of them took up the offer, abandoning Cade, who was then swiftly arrested and, yep, executed. At this time, there was also a little scandal in the kingdom, which we must mention because it would later have a massive historical impact, and also because who doesn't like a bit of gossip? The king's mother, the widow Catherine of Valois, who had been isolated in court by the regents, began a romance with a Welsh nobleman in her service named Owen Tudor. Together they had several children, the most important of whom was Edmund. He married Lady Margaret Beaufort, who had Lancaster blood running through her veins since she was the great-granddaughter of John of Gaunt and therefore could carry a claim to the throne. At the time of marriage, Edmund was 25 and Margaret was 11, but that didn't really mean much in medieval times, so the marriage was uh, consummated immediately, resulting in the birth of Henry Tudor. Little could anyone have imagined that that boy would eventually become King of England. What a beautiful story. Yeah. But that wouldn't happen for another 30 years, so for now let's just keep in mind the name of Tudor and get back to our story. The last phase of the Hundred Years' War began in 1449, when Charles VII launched a double attack on Normandy and Guienne, leading to the Battle of Formigny in 1450. The French won the day and thus regained Normandy after 30 years of English occupation. And then, three years later, the same happened with Guienne, following the Battle of Castillon. With these two victories, France finally recovered all the territory that had been under English control for 300 years. And because France is France. This also put an end to the Hundred Years' War, since Henry VI's troops were kicked out of French territory, although technically they still held the port of Calais, which remained in English hands for a little while longer. The year was 1453 and the Hundred Years' War was finally over. Hooray! At long last, England would be able to enjoy peace and prosperity. From now on, everything would be fantastic, just like in a Disney film, right? Mm, no, wrong. Sorry, wrong. If you've been following this series, by now you will have noticed that English history is basically an endless carousel of internal fighting and civil wars, and that hasn't really changed, but at least nowadays the rivalry is played out on the football pitches. The peace didn't last very long, as the next conflict erupted just two years later in 1455. This was the War of the Roses, which lasted for 32 years and was fought by the two cadet branches of the Plantagenet dynasty that had sprouted from Henry III nearly two centuries earlier. On one side was the House of Lancaster, initially descended from Edmund of Lancaster, brother of Edward Longshanks, and then reinforced by John of Gaunt and Henry Bolingbroke. At that time, they held power and comprised the royal family of Henry VI, and also Edmund Beaufort, Earl of Somerset. Their symbol was a red rose. On the other side was the House of York, descended from both Edmund of Langley, Duke of York, and also Lionel of Antwerp. At that time, it was headed by Richard of York, a powerful noble who fought in the war against France. Its badge was a white rose. 
Some historians argue that rather than one big long war, there were several smaller ones, but we're not going to delve into these little technicalities because there's a heap of stuff to get through as it is, so let's begin. In 1453, Henry VI was so depressed by the defeat in France that he suffered a psychological meltdown which lasted for nearly two years, during which he was mostly catatonic and did not understand anything or recognise anyone, even failing to respond to the birth of his son, Edward. Ironically, this malady, triggered by the defeat in France, came from his mother's side, which was the French one. Oh, sacre bleu! Evidently, having a vegetable as the head of state is far from ideal, as the UK people still well know today. So it was his resourceful wife, Margaret of Anjou, who wore the trousers around the royal palace. Although, of course, trousers hadn't been invented, so she wore the tights, I guess, that the men used to wear. She wore tights. Margaret was in charge, is what I'm saying. And she was supported by Edmund Beaufort, Earl of Somerset. The main problem was that the most powerful noble in England, Richard, Duke of York, hated Edmund and also sought to gain influence over the king. So Richard stood before Parliament, accused Edmund of treason and had him arrested. After this, he was appointed Lord Protector of England, especially because in the absence of a strong king, the other nobles preferred to have one of their own in charge, rather than an upstart foreigner, particularly a French one, let alone a woman. Inconceivable! Richard of York was married to Cecily Neville, whose family was one of the richest in England at the time, and also descended from John of Gaunt, so it had very blue blood. And if you have blue blood, please speak to your doctor. In addition, Cecily's nephew was Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, who played a very important role in the upcoming conflict, when he supported Richard of York, so much so that he would come to be known as the Kingmaker. For their part, the Nevilles had an ongoing feud with the Percy family, to whom they were related, but who supported the Royalist faction, that is, the House of Lancaster. In fact, between 1453 and 1454, the Nevilles and Percys fought a small-scale war with their private armies which wreaked havoc in Northern England. Eventually, after nearly two years, Henry VI recovered from his stupor, or basilisk stare or whatever it was, Urged by his wife Margaret, he freed Edmund Beaufort and together they kicked out Richard of York from the Regency. However, although the king had managed to bring peace for the time being, this intervention made enemies of the House of York and the Neville family. Therefore, we could argue that this was the initial trigger of the War of the Roses. Being an ambitious man, Richard of York wanted to regain his position, and so he travelled to London to politely persuade the king, uh, accompanied by an army. The first encounter was the Battle of St Albans in 1455, where the Yorkists managed to kill the leader of the Lancastrian side, Edmund Beaufort, and also Henry Percy, Earl of Northumbria. To make it even worse, Henry VI had hidden nearby when he saw his forces being defeated, but was eventually found and captured. As you'll see, this will become a common occurrence with Henry. With no other alternative, he became a puppet in the hands of Richard of York, who was then reappointed Lord Protector. This split the country into two halves. One was controlled by the House of Lancaster, with a parliament which met at Coventry, right in the middle of the country, and the other, comprising most of the rest of England, was controlled by the House of York, with a parliament that met in London. But of course, King Henry VI didn't like being in the hands of those pesky Yorkists, so he went about getting support from some important nobles. Eventually, it all came to a head in 1459, at the Battle of Ludford Bridge. There, the King's army managed to defeat Richard of York and his ally, Richard Neville, who ended up fleeing to Ireland and Calais, respectively. But this wasn't the end, far from it. Neville, who was very rich, regrouped and returned to England the following year, fighting the Royal Army at the Battle of Northampton. This time, he was victorious and managed to capture the King once again. By this point, Richard of York had decided that he wasn't going to settle for being Lord Protector anymore and instead wanted to become King. But Parliament wasn't too enthusiastic about this and plus it wasn't really legal. However, both houses managed to reach a compromise. Henry VI would be allowed to continue ruling, but his son, Edmund of Westminster, would not be the heir. Instead, upon the King's death, the crown would go to a member of the House of York, either Richard or maybe his son, the Earl of March, who was also named, you guessed it, Edward. I've heard that name somewhere before. Predictably, this agreement upset the Queen, Margaret of Anjou, who probably said something along the lines of If these English pigs think they can force me to disinherit my son, they have another thing coming and took Edward to Scotland, where she managed to put together a Lancastrian army. In 1460, Margaret's loyalist troops travelled south and met the Yorkist forces at the Battle of Wakefield. 
This time the House of Lancaster prevailed and Richard of York was captured and executed. His powers then went to his 18-year-old son, Edward of March, who turned out to be just as ambitious as his dad. The first thing he did was to join up with his father's main ally, Richard Neville, the Kingmaker. Together they reorganised the battered forces of the House of York and mounted a new campaign, defeating the Loyalists in 1461 at the Battle of Mortimer's Cross. One notable victim of this battle was Owen Tudor, the second husband of the former Queen Catherine of Valois, who was captured and killed by the House of York. Queen Margaret of Anjou then launched a counter-attack and was victorious at the Second Battle of St Albans. She managed to rescue her husband, King Henry VI, from the prison where he was being held, and together they returned to the north. Meanwhile, in London, Edward of March got himself crowned as King Edward IV in 1461. The House of York had finally managed to take the English throne, but Margaret would not give up so easily. She sought to recover her family's rightful domains, and that led to the Battle of Towton in Yorkshire, which is arguably the largest and bloodiest encounter ever fought on English soil. It took place during a frightful gale and claimed the lives of most of the key nobles from Northern Territories who had sided with the House of Lancaster. The House of York won the day and consolidated their power while the Lancastrians had to run away to Scotland. Edward IV of York then ruled England for the following 22 years, although there was a small interruption when Henry VI managed to regain the throne for a short while. Let's see how it happened. Throughout the 1460s, the House of Lancaster, supported by the Percy family, sought to regain power, but a sound defeat at the Battle of Hexham in 1464 finally put an end to that resistance. Moreover, a few months later, Henry VI was captured once again and locked up in the Tower of London. By this point, it appeared that the House of York had finally prevailed and all the unrest would soon be over. Edward IV ruled England without any opposition. He was handsome, charismatic, smart, educated and a bit of a womanizer and a drunkard too, but hey, nobody's perfect. Anyway, things were definitely going great for him, so what spoiled it all? Well, it so happened that his main ally, the kingmaker Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, was also a very ambitious man, even though he preferred wielding power in the shadows. Neville had placed one of his brothers as the Archbishop of York and another as the Earl of Northumberland after he got rid of his old enemies, the Percy family. But this wasn't nearly enough for Neville, he wanted much more. In particular, he tried to make King Edward marry an important French lady who benefited his interests, and so he brokered a deal with the King of France. But instead, Edward ignored him and secretly married Elizabeth Woodville, a minor noble whose family had actually sided with the House of Lancaster in the past. Under her influence, the king began to favour the Woodville family with important positions in his court, land and key marriages, which gradually undermined Richard Neville's power. Then, in 1469, an insurrection broke out in the north against the Woodvilles. The leader was a mysterious figure named Robin of Reddersdale, but it's thought that this was all orchestrated by Richard Neville in an attempt to regain power by getting rid of the king. In fact, he had also allied with Edward's brother, George, Duke of Clarence, and together they triumphed at the Battle of Edgecott, where Neville managed to capture King Edward IV and lock him up at Middleham Castle. Of course, despite being known as the Kingmaker, Neville didn't really have any authority to go around imprisoning kings, so eventually, under pressure from Parliament and many other nobles, he was forced to free Edward IV. He then ran away to France, to the court of King Louis XI, where he met up with his old rival, Margaret of Anjou, and her son, Edward of Westminster. These former enemies now had some common ground and became allies, in a bid to dethrone Edward IV of York. Together with some French support, their armies disembarked in England in 1471 and forced Edward IV to flee to Burgundy, since his sister Margaret had married its ruler, Duke Charles the Bold. Once in control of England, Margaret of Anjou freed her husband, Henry VI of Lancaster, and put him back on the throne, but it was really Richard Neville who pulled the strings. However, this situation didn't last very long, because the exiled Edward IV returned to England with the support of his brother-in-law, Charles the Bold, Duke of Burgundy. He arrived in Yorkshire and straight away began to win battles against the Lancastrians and their allies. At one of these encounters, specifically the Battle of Barnet, Richard Neville, Earl of Warwick, was killed. That was the end of the Kingmaker. Another figure who died at the battle was Henry Stafford, the new husband of Margaret Beaufort. The family had managed to regain their lands and they were doing quite well, but this turn of events put an end to their good fortune as they were supporters of the House of Lancaster. Fearing that the Yorkists might want to get rid of her son, Henry Tudor, Margaret told him to run for his life and he fled to France. Run, Boris! Run away! Hurry! She wouldn't see Henry again until 14 years later. 
but perhaps she would consider that wait was worth it, because when she did, it was to see him be crowned King of England, no less. Meanwhile, the last hope of the House of Lancaster, Edward of Westminster, son of Henry VI and Margaret of Anjou, led his side's forces at the Battle of Tewkesbury in 1471. That would be their final effort, as they were soundly defeated and Edward was killed, along with several prominent Lancastrian nobles. This victory was decisive for the House of York, since soon afterwards King Henry VI also died. It's not entirely clear how, but it's widely believed that he suffered a mild case of murder. Regardless, the main point is that this was the end of the road for the House of Lancaster. Edward IV of York arrived in London at this time and placed his bottom firmly on the English throne, but he had learned his lesson and quickly purged the country of his enemies, starting with the family of Richard Neville. Throughout the following 12 years, Edward IV managed to rule in relative peace. He had a firm hand and pacified the country by reducing taxes and promoting trade. And also, now that he wasn't spending all his time fighting, he focused his energies on fathering lots of children with his wife, Elizabeth Woodville. The only spot of trouble that remained for Edward was with his own brother, George Duke of Clarence, the one who had betrayed him by siding with Richard Neville. Apparently, now that Neville was dead, he had turned to necromancy. But he didn't quite manage to master the dark arts, and in 1477 he was captured, imprisoned at the Tower of London, and finally executed, allegedly by drowning in a wine barrel. All things considered, that was not the worst way to die in medieval England. As we said, the situation in England improved considerably throughout this decade. Amidst all this prosperity, King Edward indulged his vices. He was very fond of eating, drinking and womanising, and quickly became very fat and in poor health. Perhaps this explains why he croaked at the young age of 40, kicking off a new Royal Rumble for the crown in 1483. At the Royal Rumble match, it's every man for himself. The opportunity of a lifetime! The main troublemaker was another of Edward's brothers, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, although he didn't really fit the mould of an imposing nobleman, since he was said to be humpbacked and lame. On the other hand, he had married Anne Neville, daughter of Richard Neville, the kingmaker, so he had gained plenty of land up in the north. The main obstacle keeping Richard from taking the throne was his own nephew and son of the dead king, a 12-year-old boy named, would you believe it, Edward. After some back and forth, and thanks to the support of his mother's family, the Woodvilles, the boy was crowned King Edward V. Richard wasn't happy with this, and pressed Parliament to annul the marriage between Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, on the rather shaky ground that the King had had a prior, legally binding marriage contract, which hadn't been properly dissolved, and this technically made all their children illegitimate, or something like that. After some backroom scheming and probably plenty of bribery, let's be honest, this ridiculous legal loophole was accepted. Edward was made to step down You're and fine. Richard was offered the throne, thus becoming King Richard III. Yep, that's right, that one. What happened then to Edward V? Well, it isn't very clear. The only thing we know for sure is that he was marched into the Tower of London along with his brother Richard and they were never seen alive again. Their fate is a mystery, but it's safe to assume that Richard III ordered them killed in fact, he is generally considered a tyrannical and cruel man, but it's not totally clear how much of this is a black legend. In any case, Richard III only ruled for two years, because an unexpected challenger came out of nowhere to dispute his crown. It was Henry Tudor, the relatively obscure and distant relative of the House of Lancaster, who we mentioned earlier. Let's go over his background briefly. Henry Tudor's mother was Margaret Beaufort, which gave him a legitimate claim to the throne, as he was a direct descendant of Edward III via John of Gaunt. In addition, his father was Edmund Tudor, half-brother of King Henry VI, as the son of Owen Tudor and Catherine of Valois, widow of King Henry V of the House of Lancaster. Yes, I, I know it's a, a mess, but believe me, I'm, I'm trying my best to keep it as simple as possible. Look, basically, he was sort of like Daenerys Targaryen, uh, but without the dragons, unfortunately, except the one on the flag. Anyway, by this point in the story, Henry's mother, Margaret Beaufort, had remarried with a very powerful noble, Thomas Stanley, Earl of Derby, and this gained her many influential allies, including the Woodville family. If you recall, our boy Henry Tudor had spent the last 14 years, ever since Edward IV of York took the throne, living in exile in Brittany, and was pretty much penniless. However, thanks to his mother's new contacts, and with the help of the French king, who was always prepared to finance anything that might destabilise the English crown, he gradually put together a fleet and army. In 1485, he disembarked in Wales and quickly made his way towards London, coming up against the royal army of Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth. 
Given his significant numerical advantage, everything seemed to indicate that King Richard would be victorious. But then, right in the middle of fighting, two of the king's key generals, Thomas Stanley, Henry's stepfather, and his brother, switched sides to support Henry Tudor, and Richard ended up losing the battle. Even more importantly to the story, he also lost his life. In fact, he was the last king of England to be killed on a battlefield. Thus, in 1485, Henry Tudor became King Henry VII of England. Soon afterwards, he married Elizabeth of York, daughter of Edward IV, thereby uniting the Houses of York and Lancaster into a single line which merged both of them into the House of Tudor. I think you and I are going to get along just okay. This was symbolised by combining their emblems into the new Tudor Rose. Technically, this put an end to the War of the Roses, but in fact there was a last, albeit smaller, battle in 1487. This was the Battle of Stoke Field, and it was the last attempt by the House of York to take all the power by placing on the throne a boy named Lambert Simmel, who they claimed to be Edward, son of George of Clarence. But Henry VII won that battle, and then proceeded to get rid of pretty much anyone who might be considered a candidate to the throne, thereby securing his position. He's like, I am the Tiger King. The rise of the Tudor dynasty marks the passage from medieval to modern times in England, as feudalism gradually disappeared and kings stopped going to battles themselves. And that's a pity, because you can be sure that if leaders had to actually fight in the wars they'd started, we'd have far less of them. The aristocracy also saw its influence wane as a bourgeois middle class began to thrive, hand in hand with an evolution of the English Parliament. While all this was taking place, the monarchy responded by becoming increasingly authoritarian, which predictably led to plenty of trouble, but that's something that we'll explore in a separate series about this specific period. And the rest is history. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave us a big like. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video. Because he was considered an... King Louis the Ten Eleventh of Northumberland, there's children screaming outside. Right, this is what the French say. Oh, well, I, I'm gonna get it this time. So many, everything's become sounds now. Can. Sayan? Oh, fuck. I've just, I've just accepted you'll keep some of this in.